Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the first Creative Contessa um, create and chat session for uh, my patrons. We are recording, uh, but fear not, you will not be recorded. It is only the pinned windows that are being captured for posterity. And for those who are joining, you will see that there are two windows. There is the face on window for those who just want to chat with me. And then there is the top down view for people who want to see what it is I'm doing. So my project today is yet another project I started. What year is it? Four years ago. Yes, that is correct, ladies and gentlemen, four years ago. It is a new jornea. This is silk damask. And um, this, a giornea, for those who don't know, is that Italian tabard gown that's open on the sides that you wear, ladies wore in the second half of the 15th century, basically kind of from the 1440s through to the 1490s. Um, and uh, this one is modeled off of one of the, the ones that are found in the Cappella Tornaboni, the Cappella Maggiore in Santa Maria Novella in Florence. And so I'm uh, finally getting around to maybe finishing this in time to wear it pretty thick. We'll see. Okay, so this is the first time I've done a session like this. So we're still kind of figuring out the angle of the various cameras and all that. So I apologize for anything that is not absolutely ideal. Um, what I'm doing actually finally is finishing the neckline. And I'm actually kind of glad that I've waited this long because it's given me four years to really think about how I want to finish both the bottom, the the, uh, the hems, and also the neckline. And I'm actually uh, very pleased, specifically because something's here to make this camera, this above camera angle, more useful. It's always a bit of a trick to figure out where the cameras actually are, and then um, put them in the right spot. Okay. Um, I'm really glad I've waited this long because it allowed me to really consider um, several extant garments. One of them is the Camorra of Beato Sana, who maybe if you've watched any of my videos on my recent uh, it Italian Renaissance gown project, my Gamora, then you've heard this lecture, but otherwise she was a young woman who entered a convent as a prepubescent uh, girl. She was about 12 or 13 when she entered the convent, and the dress in which she entered the convent has been preserved, mostly, because she was considered very saintly. In fact, I think there was a movement to canonize her. And so uh, her dress, her childhood dress, survived all the way to the point where she died in 1506 or 1509, maybe it was 1509. But the dress dates, therefore, to the 1460s. Unfortunately, when she died, because she was a saint or considered a saint, the skirts of the gown were cut up into little pieces and handed around the convent and to other people, possibly even the Duke and Duchess of Milan, as basically relics, But and also chunks of the sleeves. But the bodice and at least the upper parts of the sleeves and the bottom top I don't know, top third of the skirt has survived. And also the, interestingly, the hemline of the skirt has survived almost entirely intact. So um, there's a lot of information we can glean from that, uh, specifically for the purposes of this gown, how to finish the hemline of a 15th century Italian gown. And so uh, for the neckline, I'm using actually the finishing on the neckline of Diego di Cavanilla's Farsetto, and for those who don't know, Diego di Cavanilla was a condottiero, powerful uh, count actually, and condottiero of the second half of the 15th century. He died in battle in 1581, and he was interred in some very, very, very nice garments. And in 2002, I think they were doing restoration work in his the church where his crypt uh, is located, um, Monastery Afaloni. Uh, that's not the entire name, but anyway. They found his garments, they washed them, they restored them, and there's various reconstructions out there floating around on them. There's theories, but the neckline on his uh, farsetto was very well preserved, the, the collar neckline specifically, and it is actually finished, if you look in the uh, overhead shot, it's actually finished in this manner. So basically, there is a strip of the same fabric as the shell, in his case, it was also a silk damask. This is a silk damask. And it seems that it is, let's see if I've done, I've pinned the whole thing, basically. 
But basically, it seems as though it is sewn same size uh, shell to shell. So top to top, oh, this, I haven't turned this yet, like this. And then it is turned to create a very, 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 very tiny, delicate, little rolled edge like this. And that actually makes a lot of sense to me because this, if, if the white linen shirt fails to protect the collar of the farsetto, then this strip will take the damage from the skin, the oils and the dirts. And then you can replace, if you keep scraps of this, which um, at dollars to donuts, they kept scraps of the fabrics of their very expensive fabrics in trunks somewhere. And then you can just replace this band with a fresh one. And I always keep the scraps from my various sewing projects neatly organized in bags that are actually labeled. I'm terrible at organization. So let me tell you, I'm proud of this idea that I came up with. When I actually label it, you know, scraps from pink giornea or scraps from purple kirtle or whatever. And then whenever I need replacement patches for the wear and tear that I put on my garments, I can just go and pull it out of my supply. So there you go. Both finishing ideas based on period garments and storage ideas <clears throat> for how you can best use uh, your scraps. Now, if you have weight, lots and lots and lots of scraps, then there's other things you can do with them, both uh, medieval and modern, of course cabbage as some people call the, all the scraps and some people just keep all their cabbage in one big uh, chest disorganized for maybe turning into patchwork quilts or other other works but I really do prefer to keep mine organized so that I can repair my garments as needed and let me tell you a lot of my 15th century Burgundian gowns yeah they've um they have uh needed a lot of patching around the hemline especially so if you look closely at the turn back guards of my burgundian style 15th century gowns you will see very nicely and very carefully applied patches that have replaced the bits of turn back lining that have just worn away after me literally dragging them everywhere for probably thousands of miles at this point over the years the, of course, the problem with dragging skirts on the ground in the modern world is that we have these very rough paved surfaces that um, just aren't anything like a medieval surface. Even a medieval paved surface isn't rough like concrete or um, McAdam Road um, asphalt. So there's like more asphalt. So oh. those sorts of modern paved surfaces do a whole different level of damage to garments and fabric than you know a medieval paving stones would have done or marble or whatever sort of surface various polities used to pave their roads if they paved them many medieval cities did not have paved streets they were dirt so that also actually does less damage much less damage than a paved surface would do well, then a rough paved surface would do anyway. And grass, of course, which is if you're a noble lady, as I am attempting to emulate, uh, then, you know, maybe you should only be walking in nice grassy garden surfaces when you're outside. Therefore, dragging your gown on nice, smooth, well-manicured lawns. So I'm just uh, going through, I've already, I've already sewn this safe to self to self, right? And um, so now I'm just turning it. And I used a, what I call a running, a, a running backstitch. You can get up closer here and it can be seen. So it's a running backstitch, which means there's a little bit of space between each of my backstitches. Not too much though. Um, but this really doesn't need to be very tight. Oh, look at that. There's already a little bit of a grease stain there. That's not ideal. Well, let's see if I can get that out using some techniques. I mean, honestly, even though this is never, actually, I did wear this unfinished for a Zoom ball a couple of years ago. <laughs> so I guess it has been worn. I was about to say it hasn't even been worn and it's already developing a stain, but it's okay. There's actually uh, several 
manuals of medieval dying, medieval manuals of dying, not, not modern ones about medieval dying, but medieval books on dying. And they actually also often talk about laundry treatments, which is really handy. So there's some very specific laundry treatments for things like grease stains and the manuals often delve into the different treatment for different fabrics. So they acknowledge that there is rightly a difference in how you treat different materials, not only based on the different stain, but the material itself. And one of the, there's a couple of interesting ones for grease stains that I would like to try, not on a garment that I'm actually wearing, but on a test patch, obviously. A lot of them use some pretty uh, powerful and corrosive, corrosive chemicals. Uh, lye, for instance, is used in, I mean, obviously lye is the basis of, of soap. So it kind of makes sense that you would use lye to treat some really heavy stains, but lye in large, uh, large concentrations is really bad for the skin. I mean, it's, it's a, um, it's a base, but still, you know, Anything that's too basic or does is is the same kind of effect on your skin as anything that's too acidic, which is why laundry women, uh, laundresses were known for having, you know, horribly cracked and bleeding hands in many periods. Now, granted, there were things you could do to counter that. Uh, natural treatments, for example, um, tallow. Tallow is actually a really good moisturizer for your skin. It might not smell the best maybe to be on your person, but it would definitely protect your skin against the ravages of doing laundry in a pre-washing machine fashion. So I'm just going around and rolling this. And I'm going to do it entirely and then I'm going to adjust it because I want, I want this to be you know, the, the rolled part to be pretty even as it is on Diego de Cavanilla's neckline. And also I want it to be pretty tiny. His is, his is very tiny. And I'm, there's a couple of ways that that could be created. Um, I kind of actually want to go to the monastery in Italy and see if they'll give me permission to actually look at his real garments. I mean, I know that's very unlikely to happen, but maybe they might let me do that. Anyway, what I, of course, if they've already restored it and already fixed it, it will be hard for me to determine. What I want to say is I'm wondering if on his, this part, the, the seam, because this is a very small, small, small seam allowance here on purpose. It doesn't need to be a lot. I'm wondering if on his, if it is, um, if it's actually a slightly bigger seam allowance, making it easier to fold over on itself and create a tight little roll. Whereas this very narrow seam allowance, there's not actually enough for me to fold really, so to say. So my choice is either to fold, just fold this flat like this, fold it like this and create this kind of um, like piped seam, but that doesn't, that's not the way it looks. That's not what it is in the original or to just accept basically the seam allowance as is, as the width of my turn back rolled, rolled edge. So there it is. Be interesting to know what it is on his. On his, it definitely looks very tight though. There is no, it looks as though the fabric, the, the facing fabric has definitely been stretched, taut over top of that seam allowance. And in fact, from his Jornea, the, the, the facing of his Jornea survived not attached to the Jornea itself. So you can actually see that it's a very similar, similar thing to the strips here because the facing of his Jornea is two strips <laughs> of fabric, of same fabric as the shell fabric. And you can see, if you look closely at the Jornea facing, you can actually see there's again, a preserved edge like this. So the preserved rolled edge, finished edge, survived in the facing and kind of broke away entirely from the Jornea itself, which, you know, I guess that makes sense with the way things can rot over time, especially in a tomb with the lovely juices 
from that result from the composition of a human body. Sorry, right. tea time with the Contessa. Let's talk about rotting bodies. And if any of you who join in, remember this is supposed to be a good chance for you to ask your questions about your projects. So do feel free to show me your projects, ask questions. Don't worry, you will not, your face will not be recorded. Your voice will, but your face will not. So fear not on that score. And if you're watching this in retrospect, of course, feel free to ask questions about anything I'm discussing. It will, of course, be harder for me to advise you on your garments when it's a recording, as in impossible, except as possibly through the comments, but. So we're coming up on Penzik again. For those who don't know, Penzik is a two week uh, medievalist event in Western Pennsylvania uh, that attracts anywhere from 9,000 to 12,000 people. And this year it's looking like it might attract 12 to 13,000. Anyway, the point of that is that this time last year, I started my Gamora project, the Gamora, that was supposed to be done in time for last Penzik. And that Gamora is not yet done in time for this Penzik. So we'll see if I can actually get it done in time for Penzik or maybe just during Penzik so I can wear it during Penzik. We'll see, life has thrown some big wrenches at me over this last year. Um, so I have not had the level of productivity on my creative crafting front as I would like, but also uh, editing videos takes a long time to produce a good quality video. It takes like 50 hours easily per video. So even just the, I, instead of spending time creating, I mostly spend time editing these days because when I started this whole uh, creative content venture in the distant mists of time during COVID, <laughs> uh, the deal was that my condottiero was going to be my video editor. He was going to be my production team, but unfortunately or fortunately, he is pursuing higher education in the form of a master's of business in international business administration. And so uh, that's left me with all of the editing duties. So I've gotten very good at video editing. So I haven't, I haven't gotten much creating done, but with all the video creation. <laughs> um, yeah, it's gotten to the point where honestly, I could probably procure full-time employment editing video content for any given organization. Yeah, never thought I'd be a filmmaker, not I. But now, when, now whenever I go anywhere, I'm literally looking at the world through the lens of, ooh, that's a beautiful shot. Ooh, that would be gorgeous. Oh, look at the lighting. Look at the way that's framed. I, yeah, who would have thunk? So I've got this mostly pinned. And actually, you can see, so I experimented with, I, I wanted to see the two options full out. So this option um, this first option that I'm showing in the above shot. This option you can see is uh, my first experiment with creating what I'm going to refer to as the piped edge, um, even though that's probably not the correct term, but it definitely does not look like Dio de Cabanilla. So I'm going to be redoing this, but it's going to be fun because it's been pinned this way since I was in Mongolia, which was a month ago, because I did this on my Mongolian air flight back from Europe in in uh, July or June when I was returning from my two weeks in Florence and my five day medievalist event in the Netherlands. So I'm going to go ahead and pull these pins out. I might have to get the ironing board, uh, bring it over here and do some ironing or I might pause the recording, <laughs> go do some ironing and come back. So that's the, so my ironing not on screen is not saved for posterity. If I'd, I guess the next time I do this, I'll probably set up an ironing board right here behind me. It's okay because I'm sitting on the ground and I can feel my leg slowly going to sleep. So that's not, that's not ideal. <clears throat> now on this, think about what I'm about to say. So on my facing here, um, I did just two pieces of facing, two strips that Nope, I did one apparently. Um, instead of two, I did one. And the original in Diego de Cavanilla's Jornea, he has two. It's two strips. 
So I'm not certain why I didn't do two strips when I was doing this. Well, anyway, that just means I have some seamy stuff I have to do here at the at the joining point. I've got to actually bring that. It's a bit messy here. I'm going to have to actually bring that seam closer down to where it actually finishes so that when I turn this back, it turns back nicely. I think I'm actually just going to cut. I'm going to cut cut this open so that it makes it very easy to neatly turn that and fold it in on itself here at the, uh, the seam because right now it's just one strip. And I don't know why I did that. Honestly, see the difference between Diego de Cavanilla's Jornea and this Jornea is that his of course has the round neckline of the gentleman's Jornea, whereas this has the deep plunging front and back of the sexy lady's Jornea. Therefore, I think um, when I do this again and Hopefully I will someday <laughs> where I reach old age and <laughs> don't get to create anything because I'm only video editing. Um, on the next one, I would definitely cut two separate strips for certain. Um, and possibly because of the sharpness of the neckline, um, the, the way it's just two Vs, I might actually possibly do four strips. Sorry, I had to stop for a moment and make sure my math was correct. I might possibly do four strips. So it would be one strip for this part of the neckline, one strip for this part of the V, one strip for this part of the V, one strip for this part of the V. So one strip per V half, basically. I think that would probably make more sense. Yeah. Well, this is how experimental archaeology works and experimental reconstruction works. Maybe someday we will find in a tomb, um, in a crypt that gets opened, ladies' garments as well preserved as Diego de Cabanillas, we can only hope. So um, that all being said, it's a question of whether I want to, no, I think I'm just going to, for this part, I'm just going to go ahead and let that fold on itself for now and roll it over like that rather than cut into it and then have a fray, possibly fraying edge. Although this, 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 this silk damask is very densely woven and so pretty, pretty high quality. Oh, I just stretched out my leg and realized I had pinched the nerves off. So that leg is springing back to life. That's fun. So let's see, I read in the news today, the archeology span news about a shipwreck, an ancient Roman shipwreck with a whole bunch of ancient Roman glass in it. So I'm very excited. That was just the headline. I'm very excited to go and check out that trove of glass finds from ancient Rome. So for those of you who uh, maybe haven't been following so closely on my community posts on YouTube, um, I had a very rude gentleman actually um, criticize me for daring to include 16th century items in my medievalist must-haves. <laughs> How dare I? Um, and call them medieval. I mean, you know, medieval is a variously defined period that literally just means between the ages, and those ages in question are antiquity and the modern world. So, you know, um, what is medieval? Of course, some people would say, no, it's between antiquity and the Renaissance. Well, the Renaissance didn't just spring up overnight out of nothing and was in all places at all times. Ergo, medieval covers a much broader span than just, you know, 1500. Anyway, he uh, also criticized me for including a Guterral that he claimed was only specific to one time and place, except that I found illustrations of it, the particular style of Guterral being extant from the 15th through the 16th centuries across kind of all of Central Europe. Anyway, the point of that is uh, I'm planning possibly on doing a new video on that beautiful wonky piece of glass, blown glass decanter known as the Guterol or the Kutrof or the Gutrof or yeah, there's a lot of different words for it in, um, in Central Europe. And uh, so that glass find from the ancient Roman wreck might be very interesting in providing perhaps some ancient, more ancient Roman versions of that beautiful wonky glass decanter for my new video because I found in in coming up with a repost for his rude remarks I actually found some very new and interesting information about those glass decanters and their uses and history in Europe and spread in Europe so maybe I was thinking a new video on it might be interesting especially considering 
but I'm much better at video editing and production values have gone up, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it's funny, a lot of, you know, I often get criticized by pedants for calling something in the 15th century, in 15th century Italy medieval. Like, well, is in 15th century Burgundy, that's medieval. Oh, yes, absolutely. 15th century Burgundy, 100% medieval. But 15th century Florence is not. Are they existing in two different timelines? You know, and there's a reason that historians are trying to move away from terms like medieval and Renaissance, because it turns out, that that's not how history works. That's not how culture works. That, you know, you literally flip a switch and overnight you go from medieval to Renaissance to modern. Um, but unfortunately, I still rely on a lay audience for to support my content. And so I have to use terminology that is understood by a lay audience and specifically that is understood by YouTube's algorithms. The algorithm gods must be appeased. So, um, you know, medieval dance is a much more sought after uh, product, shall we say by name, than Renaissance dance. Very few people know, have, have the idea of Renaissance dance, only dance history, early dance geeks. Do, really the average person when they think about dance in the earlier ages they're much more likely to do a search for medieval dance for instance so if they're looking for medieval dance and i call my dance on 15th century my video on 15th century italian dance renaissance dance they're not going to click on it even though really the dances being done in italy in the 15th century have a lot of very medieval elements to them especially musically and especially if you compare it to the kind of music and dance that was being done in italy in the 16th century Anyway, point is that it's silly to get wrapped up in, in, you know, being getting upset about wow, fifteenth century that must be Renaissance, but is it? And does it matter really? The point is, it's not modern, and uh, for the average layperson, that's kind of all they care about when they're first looking out there for in tutorials on both clothing and. Uh, and dance. Now, what is important for me is that I provide the correct date, actually, for anything I teach. So, which I do in all my videos, I never prevaricate. I tell you exactly when things are dated to, if it's possible to date them, whether it's dancing or objects or clothing, whatever. And then you, dear viewer, get to make the decision on whether the, the object from that time period that I'm presenting, the experience, etc., is the right time period and place for you. I give you the information you decide. I'm not gonna tell you what's right for you unless you ask me and I guess I can try to tell you what might be right for you. But the reality is that new information is constantly coming to light. You know, a lot of people used to imagine the medieval European world is this as though a wall existed around Europe and there was no interaction between Europeans and peoples from other parts of the world. It was a very, very sort of just a whole bunch of Europeans wandering around. And that's just not true. There were people from all over the world coming to and interacting on the European stage. And, and beyond the, the Silk Road, I mean, the Silk Road was certainly something that connected people for those who don't know, for instance, there have been multiple finds in first millennium Korean tombs, royal tombs, multiple finds of ancient Roman glassware um, and, and or glassware from the early Byzantine empire, perfectly preserved in these tombs. So those glasses were blown in Constantinople or those glass vessels were blown in Constantinople and made it all the way through to Korea, the far, almost the furthest point on the Asian, Eurasian continent that you can get. So yeah, um, I would say that maybe we have to, many people have to re-examine their preconceptions about medieval Europe and how diverse it actually was versus how diverse people think it was. And embrace that diversity. The medieval world is a colorful, interesting place. 
I mean, obviously, it's most likely that the further you get away from the center of commerce and activity, i.e. the Mediterranean, perhaps the less interesting and colorful it becomes. Well, interesting is too judgmental, less colorful, but... The, that doesn't mean that there weren't people from Africa who made their way up to England or up to Scandinavia at some point, either as part of a delegation or as part of a ship's crew. is thicker oh maybe i need to trim that actually so here here the my seam allowance got a got a touch a couple of millimeters <laughs> thicker which i know might not seem like much but is making a little bit of a difference here in how tightly i can roll this and actually it's it's definitely allowing me a little bit more to actually roll and which is coming much closer to creating the look of Diego de Cabanilla's rolled collar. I'm going to try to pin this and see if I maybe don't need to iron it. I know that's super lazy. I should just iron it, really. So I actually have to look at my schedule for Penzik. I have, for those of you who are attending Penzik, I have so many classes I'm teaching and I'm hosting at least three balls <laughs> or leading dance they're at. Uh, I'm hosting my red and gold ball. And I think that's the first Friday or the middle Friday of the event. And then I'm hosting what I call my Enchanted Picnic. And my Enchanted Picnic is all about creating an immersive courtly medievalist experience in which we really try to be the medieval people we're, we're researching. So no discussion, no blatantly modern discussions, couching everything in medieval terms, um, engaging in authentic courtly interactions, dancing, poetry, reciting, storytelling, um, playing games. You know, it's a proper 15th century, well, 14th, 15th century picnic or pre-modern picnic. I don't discriminate on the particular time period that people are seeking to portray. And some, some purists call that LARPing, disdainfully deride that as LARPing. But you know, it's funny about those purists. Um, they have what they consider anyway to be perfectly authentic. And don't get me started on my authenticity rant, um, to be perfectly authentic clothing and kit. But then when they interact with each other, they're just modern people wearing medieval stuff. So it's basically a dress up party. <laughs> <laughs> Funny that, not a LARP, but a dress up party. So, um, you know, what's the point of doing all that if you're not also going to engage in the interactions, attempt to interact in a medieval fashion? You know, in my opinion, that's the whole fun is interacting in a medieval fashion. I mean, for me, it's both parts. You need to have the nice kit to feel like you're interacting in a medieval fashion, but you need to interact in a medieval fashion to do your kit justice so that you're not just at a dress up party. And that's why I come at it from both angles. And it isn't LARPing because it's not a game because a LARP, a live action role-playing game has rules about point systems and advancement. And there's some kind of overarching story that's kind of guiding the characters along. That's, you know, interacting with each other in a natural fashion pretending to be in a medieval era is not the same as LARPing. 
I think that's another form of experimental archaeology in which maybe anthropology even, in which we're experimenting with beha the behavior, behavioral and cultural norms from a past era in a very specific context. You know, obviously we're sticking precisely and on purpose to a courtly context because there were very strict rules that kept those interactions courteous, shall we say. Um, and obviously medieval culture was full of brutality and, and horror although maybe not really more so than any other era, just a different kind. So I choose to focus on recreating and experiencing what I consider to be the positive aspects rather than trying to recreate the horrific aspects. So making my way around the neckline here. Yeah, it's a little hard in spots to convince it to be even all the way around. <clears throat> um, and that might be that I have to go back through and tighten it a little bit more around the, the seam allowance of the neckline. I'm trying as much as possible to pin it in the ditch, as it were. So that, that seam, instead of poking holes in my silk damask. On this side in particular, I'm running into, uh, running into, <laughs> it's fighting me because of how I had it pinned <laughs> for all that time. So it, uh, and there I definitely have a bigger seam allowance, not on purpose. I think I thought I'd just go through and trim that up. Reconstructing my own thoughts and my own thought processes. This is what happens when you start a project and then it takes four years to complete it. I don't know about you, dear viewer, but I, if I don't complete a project quickly enough, then I often end up abandoning it because then by the time I get back to it, I've learned so much more that I consider what I started to be incorrect. <laughs> the, the historic, the, the living historian's dilemma, <laughs> the, the living historian creator's dilemma. Hmm. Oh, and just in case some of you may be wondering what kind of garment I'm wearing, this is actually called a cholik in Korean, and this is a cholik style dress. Um, so this is sort of a modernized hanbo arrangement. Um, so it's taking a historic Korean garment, which was actually mostly worn by men, <laughs> and it's now been transformed into a modern dress style. I did not make this. I purchased, I had it made. I purchased it from uh, the traditional market here in, in Tegu, Salmon Market. And uh, it's actually made of hemp, which makes it a great summer garment because it's hemp breathes really, really well. Yeah, I can tell I'm gonna have to go back through and tighten up some of these spots a little bit. If I want to create that same same look as Diego de Cavanilla's garment. Oh, I should maybe cut that needle out. And um... <laughs> so then that 
that brings us to the uh, question of, um, you know, how am I going to then finish this? So on Diego's, it's not really clear in the pictures if there is a tiny little hem here. Um, so I have to decide if I'm just going to whip stitch this to the lining. Um, you know, trim it obviously because it's taken some, it's gotten a little fuzzy from being hauled from pillar to post, um, from, you know, Seoul to Florence to Seoul to Ulaanbaatar to Florence to the Netherlands to Frankfurt to Ulaanbaatar back to Seoul back to Daegu. Um, anyway, lots of hauling around. So I'm going to have to trim some of these threads that have kind of uh, frayed out from all of that impact. And then I'm going to have to decide and also trim it up maybe a little more neatly because, wow, that's really not my best cutting job, is it? Um, and then decide whether I'm just going to whip stitch that on that down or if I'm actually going to fold it and and then whip stitch it. I think I might actually try the trimming and just folding it um, rather than trimming, excuse me, trimming it and just pure whip stitching it and see see how that goes because I don't think thinking back to the strips, the, the extant facings from uh, Diego's Jornea, I don't I don't recall there being a termed edge that has been preserved in or any signs of it, not not folds, not stitch holes or anything. So I think maybe on his it was uh, just just kind of um, turned and then whip stitched. So we'll, I might actually try that and see how that goes. Yeah. Um, but basically, just got, this is the facing that will be going on the skirt. Um, so I guess maybe I'll take a moment to just briefly discuss the, how I'm going to finish the bottom of the skirt. So uh, in essence, I'm going to be using the method that is on the bottom of the Beato Osana's um, Gamora. Um, uh, Diego's, Diego's Jornea, unfortunately, the, the, the line the, it was probably lined. Um, the lining has not really been preserved, just little tiny spots of it, like little fragments <laughs> have been preserved of a silk lining. <laughs> um, so we don't know how it was finished. But no matter what, his jornea did not drag on the ground, whereas mine will. And uh, Beata or Osana's Camora uh, has a facing on the bottom. Um, and the facing on hers is actually, I think, the shell fabric. Oh, well, I cut this facing out before I really looked that closely at it. Um, and so the facing on hers is done so that the facing actually the facing actually protrudes out a little bit, sort of like that. And the facing is what takes the damage from the, being dragged around rather than the shell fabric. So that is definitely something that this garment will need. Uh, so that is how I'll be finishing the back side. The front side, unfortunately, I finished years ago. <laughs> and um, I just, with the front, with the front, I just, tucked the edges in the edges of the lining and the edges of the shell in and then stab stitched it, which does create a very, very nice finish. So in that sense, it's not unfortunate per se, but what is unfortunate is that this will also start to wear. And um, so I might actually go through and attach a guard in addition to this finish lining just to protect, protect the shell fabric from wear and tear and even the lining from, from wear and tear. So I might actually, oh, I didn't quite finish it all the way. Apparently I still have some stab stitching to do. Look at that. Huh. What happens when you start a project four years ago and then just hang it up and say, you're going to get back to it someday. Okay, well, everyone, that has been your Creative Contessa patron uh, chat. Um, no one was able to join us this morning or well, no one who wanted to chime in anyway. Um, and that's fine. So if you're watching this in retrospect, let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. I hope you've enjoyed, if you're watching this recording, I hope you've enjoyed uh, 
watching me hold forth. And if you were here present and just decided not to chime in, thank you for joining. And thank you so much for being a patron, a Patreon patron and supporting my content work. I really do appreciate it. I know that money is getting really tight these days. And so I'm really honored when people decide that I am worthy of their investment. Let me know in the comments below, dear patrons, if you would like to see any future, uh, any specific sort of content going forward. Otherwise, until next time, guys, stay creative. Bye. And now you get to see me stand up and stop the recording. <laughs>